Hi everyone. So the title for this mini lecture is Instance Theory and Minerva 2. This learning module for this week is all about computational modeling in cognitive psychology. And there's lots of varieties of computational models. I've chosen to talk about Minerva 2 as an example because I think it applies quite broadly across cognition and uh, it's a neat model to think about. It's also a nice example of computational modeling. So here's a quick overview. I will warn in advance this learning module will involve some math, but I'll try to keep it user friendly. The whole model was in many ways inspired by a, a kind of like a poetic theory of cognition that we'll talk about at the beginning. Um, one of the important goals for this learning module is to communicate some general principles of instance theory. And we'll see how these ideas can be used both in a computational way and in a kind of general principle way. Um, once we understand what these principles are, a purpose of this learning module is to see how one could implement these theoretical principles into a theory that can be expressed in a computer script. We'll also talk about why you would want to express a theory in a computer script. And um, once we take a closer look at the end here, we're actually gonna open up Microsoft Excel. I think we'll use that or maybe Google Sheets. Um, so we're not gonna take a look at any computer code, but we'll look at the concepts in this model and see how they could be implemented in an Excel spreadsheet. And hopefully this will help you understand a little bit more, um, get, give you a feeling for how these models work and how they're used in cognition. So let's get started. Uh, there is no textbook reading for, for this module, but I assigned this paper here by Randy Jameson, Brendan Johns, John Bokey, and Michael Jones called Instance Theory as a Domain General Framework for Cognitive Psychology. And uh, I don't go over everything they talk about in that paper in this uh, mini lecture, but a lot of what I'm talking about will supplement what they're talking about. And in that paper also, they bring up the Minerva 2 model, which we'll go into some depth on here. I'd like to start by uh, referring to a concept called an intuition pump. This is something that the philosopher Dan Dennett talked about. And here's a definition from Wikipedia. Intuition pumps allow thinkers to use their intuition to develop an answer to a problem. And what I'll say is that instance theory is a productive intuition pump for cognition. And um, well, what does that mean? For example, I often use instance theory in my own research. And um, once you understand the basic assumptions of the theory uh, and how they work together, you can apply them in different scenarios uh, as a way to form intuitions or expectations or predictions about how cognition might work in that scenario. And this is uh, why it can be really helpful to have theories in psychology. This is one reason why. Now, um, if we have some basic operating assumptions that we can use to, to uh, make intuitions or predictions about how cognition will work somewhere, it can be extremely helpful to further develop and formalize these intuitions. Um, for example, uh, if I th had some ideas about how a theory worked, maybe the way you thought the theory worked was uh, slightly different. If we were to talk about what our intuitions were based on our own understandings, we might come up with um, different predictions. Uh, it's possible to com uh, in increase the conformity of our predictions so that if I understood 
uh, a theory one way, if I specified exactly what my understanding was, another person could achieve that very same understanding, and we could both agree that these assumptions lead to particular predictions. And so we, we would have less disagreement on what the theory is actually predicting. So we're going to be talking in this learning module about an example theory of cognition. And to set the stage, I want to just talk in general about how theories in cognition often get forwarded. So typically there'll be some question uh, about how a particular cognitive ability works. Now this could be any of the ones we've talked about in class or ones we haven't talked about. How do people remember things? How do people pay attention to things? How do people know? How do people re recognize faces? How do, how do people do math? You know, any one of those topics is an example of a cognitive ability. And you could ask the question, well, how do people do those things? How, how do those abilities work? And we'll often find two classes of explanations or theories in cognition, domain general explanations and special system explanations. So domain general explanations, what these ones typically look like um, is an argument that whatever the ability is, it emerges from general uh, perception, attention, learning, and memory processes. And this, um, so for example, the same types of learning and memory processes that help you remember what you ate for breakfast might be involved in helping you remember um, which numbers, um, like if you were to do like four times four, for example, what number is that equal? And um, if you did a lot of multiplication problems as a kid, uh, maybe the same processes that help you remember those answers can help you do other types of memory problems. So it's just an example. Uh, oftentimes domain general explanations involve um, the assumption that a person has lots of experience in, in a well-structured environment. And so this usually refers to the idea that, you know, for example, people, we grow up in pretty rich environments with lots of stuff going on visually and lots of sounds and um, uh, the patterns in our experience um, might be learned and useful for uh, allowing us to make sense of the world and allowing us to uh, generalize our knowledge from some patterns to other situations. So if we're turning to special system explanations, these type of explanations usually invoke some type of special module that has unique processing algorithms to solve a problem. So for example, take the topic of face identification. This is something that people do all the time. You look at somebody and you can uh, recognize who they are by looking at their face. And that um, you could think of that as a kind of object recognition. So for example, how about if I was to hold up a different object here, I've got a, one of these. So what is that? It's a tape measure. I've got a tape measure on my desk for some reason. Um, and if you were able to identify that as a tape measure, uh, we could ask a kind of question here. Um, when you look at my face and you identify me as Matt, the cognitive psychology instructor, are, are you using the same perception, attention, learning, and memory processes that you use for general object recognition, like recognizing this tape measure? Or are you using something more specific? Maybe there's like a special uh, face recognition module uh, that people use to do this. And in fact, the uh, literature has proposed these two different concepts or ways of thinking about face recognition. Um, 
special system explanations also typically rely on um, what I'll say are internally um, pre-structured uh, systems that are sensitive to um, relevant information somehow. So the idea might be something like with face perception, uh, although you could learn a lot about what faces look like through experience with faces, and people certainly have a lot of experience with faces, um, is just that experience alone uh, enough to explain how good people are at face recognition? Or do we need to assume that there is a face recognition module that uh, is you know, particularly potentially uh, evolved in some way to solve that specific problem. All right, so those are some questions for theoretical development in cognition in general. We're not gonna talk much more about special system explanations. What we're gonna do is go into uh, instance theory, which is a, a kind of domain general theory. So what is instance theory? It's a collection of domain general processing assumptions about how memory functions. It's interesting in that it can be formalized computationally, which means all of it just all of the assumptions of instance theory can be made very specific so that we all know what we're talking about. And these theories can provide a basis to evaluate uh, a, a bunch of things. So we could evaluate um, how episodic memory systems work. We could evaluate whether these these ideas can explain more than just what they were originally intended to explain. So it's possible that um, memory processes might be involved in a range of abilities that we don't normally think of as just uh, being about memory. Once you have a model working, uh, it can also, so it might be able to explain what was, what the target phenomena is, but it also can be exploratory. So uh, it goes back to the, to the intuition pump idea. By evaluating the model, it might give you, um, ask, help you ask further questions and, and send, um, help identify new research directions. All right. So as a historical side note, and to make a connection with a, a claim I made at the very beginning here, uh, let's talk about mnemic psychology for a moment. Um, modern instance theory is, broad in, uh, is broadly consistent with Richard Seaman's theory of memory that he proposed in a book called Mnemic Psychology from 1923. And Richard Seaman, he was a German uh, memory theorist. One thing that's interesting about him was his ideas were mostly forgotten and, or not known in... Um, many psychology circles until they were translated into English. And this happened in, in the 1940s or 50s. Um, there was a paper in 1978 by Schachter Eichen-Tolving called Richard Seaman's Theory of Memory. And it's quite an interesting paper because they point out that, you know, most people hadn't heard of this theory in 1978. However, uh, many elements of the theory were very consistent with how memory research had progressed, uh, even without having read this. So um, we'll see that many of the ideas that were that uh, Richard Seaman was talking about uh, are used in the computational theories of instance theory, the computational models here. Yeah. Um, let's take a minute to read through some of the chapters of mnemic psychology. And I don't expect anyone to be able to understand what this means, what this stuff means. So here we have uh, a few of the things I'll talk about in the book. Mnemic sensations, extinction of original excitations and survival of the engram. Some potentially some new words here. 
Richard Seaman was making up all of these words. You, you might have heard of the word engram before, potentially, and Richard Seaman made up that word. Oh, here we have the separate engram and the simultaneous complex of engrams, or the individually acquired store of engrams. How about ekphory and the different forms of association, or the ekphoric quantivalence of components, and so on. I'll stop here. Uh, lots of fun words that will, uh, well, I won't, I guess I won't leave you in too much suspense. Richard Seaman made up a lot of these words himself. They never, never existed before. And he did this in order to be very precise with his definitions. And I'll say more about it in, in, in a moment. Let's uh, take a little closer look here. And this is where we start to see uh, a theory of memory that's being expressed in a kind of interesting poetry. Um, so let's uh, talk about this thing called the engram complex. And this is translated into English from Richard Seaman's German descriptions. Uh, he had proposed something called the law of engraphy. And what is that? It's the idea that all simultaneous excitement in an organism form a connected stimulation excitement complex which as such works engraphically, that is, leaves behind a connected engram complex, which insofar forms a whole. That's a lot. Let's keep going. So the second mnemic principle, which he calls the law of ekphory, is as follows. The partial return of the energetic situation which formerly worked engraphically, operates ekphorically on a simultaneous engram complex. Ooh, don't worry, these things aren't going to be on, on the quiz. Uh, so we see a bunch of interesting words in here. Engram, engraphy, ekphory, some aren't in here. Acoluthic, homophony. These are all words that would appear in Richard Seaman's theory. Uh, they were invented, I, like I said, by Richard Seaman. And there's, a, there's an interesting kind of uh, contrast or similarity to Ebbinghaus. Remember Hermann Ebbinghaus, um, when he was remembering sequences, he wanted to make sure he didn't have any prior experience with, sequence, with the sequences he was trying to remember. So he came up with random CVC syllables. Try to remember these um, uh, pairs of letters. And um, he thought that he wouldn't have pre existing associations with those things. He would try to control for that. Now, that was an experiment that he was running. Richard Seaman didn't really run experiments, but he thought that everyday words that people would use, like we would use the word memory or remember. He thought those words uh, carried a lot of pre-existing associations with them. So your understanding of the word remembering or attention, it, uh, you know, you know what that word means and it means something to you. And if he was going to use that word in describing his theory, you might misunderstand what he's trying to say because you're thinking that um, he means what you think remembering means. So to try to avoid that, uh, he came up with his own words that didn't have any meaning, that no one ever heard of. And as he described his theory, he tried to define very precisely what he meant by these things so that you wouldn't have pre-existing um, wrong, wrong uh, so I guess it'd be easier to figure out what he was exactly trying to say. Uh, so some of the things that we'll see carry forward into instance theory, one is the idea of this n-gram. And he has a nice way of describing this. It's a connected stimulation excitement complex. And uh, later on, we'll see that 
essentially means that when people have an experience, uh, you know, we could think of that experience as being very complex and involving a whole bunch of different types of stimulation. That is perceptual stimulation. You've got visual and audio and scent, uh, touch and smell. And any given experience has uh, just a whole bunch of stimulation across the senses all at once. And um, this uh, sensory experience complex field is something that somehow gets, for lack of a better word, stored in a memory system. So he's thinking about these n-gram complexes as something we'll later call a memory trace that gets stored in a memory system. Um, we'll talk about later on the idea of bringing back to mind a prior experience. And he uses the word ekphory to describe that process. Uh, all right. Oh, one more thing, I, I guess just to set up the ideas. Um, he talks about this concept here, the partial return of the energetic situation. That's an interesting way to talk about it. Uh, and this idea is that something going on right now, like for example, if I bring this tape measure back, uh, you know, now I'm thinking about this tape measure and what's that doing for me memory wise? Well, uh, got a little bit of construction noise going on. All right, but I'm also thinking about some other things such as why was the tape measure on my desk? And well, that's because I was measuring this room because I might want to do some renovations in it a couple of days ago. And thinking about that makes me think about some other things that are got not exactly so connected. Like, I've got this little sketch pad here, and I was drawing out on in there uh, some ideas on how I might want to renovate this room. But that made me think about uh, a new pen that I just got, which is right here. And, and so you see what's happening is uh, one pattern is reminding me of another pattern, which is reminding me of another pattern, and so on. And uh, Richard Seaman is talking about that when he talks about the partial return of the uh, energetic situation. And, you know, pieces of one pattern can be remind or connected to pieces of other patterns and they can be reminding you in, in this complicated situation. So we'll see all of these ideas again throughout this lecture and then we'll start formalizing them into a computational theory. All right, so here's, a, here's a, another way to think about uh, the same ideas that we will later uh, take a look at more programmatically in Excel. All right, but before I talk about this one, I'm just gonna skip ahead really quick because I wanna say something that I probably should have said at the beginning. Uh, so here's the really big picture idea that is, I hope, more clear than that interesting poetic language from Richard Seaman. The big idea is that lots of cognitive abilities may be understood in terms of processes involved in cued recall. Okay, we've talked about cued recall a little bit in the memory chapters. And in a cued recall procedure, uh, People usually study pairs of things, and then later on you get one of the things, and that will be the cue, and you have to remember well, what was the thing paired with it. Uh, but we, you know, cued recall is something that happens all the time. Um, for example, we were just doing that when I said, "What did this remind me of?" This is the cue, and it reminded me of some things that I recalled. So the big idea here is that how we remember or store all of our experiences and then how individual pieces of a current experiment, 
experience might act as a cue prompting us to recall prior experiences. This is cued recall. And um, one of the big ideas in the instance theory reading is that these processes might be involved in a wide number of cognitive abilities. So uh, let's talk about uh, some more examples here. Uh, we will see momentarily, yeah, we're going to see that the, the Minerva II model of memory is inspired by concepts of physical resonance. And I'm sorry for some of the pausing and the uh, construction noise. I've got some workers out there and then they're fixing the building. I'm trying to pause it whenever I hear the hammers. Uh, all right, so what is physical resonance? So this is a general physical process where waves from one source, say over here, uh, they travel and they impact another medium and that medium starts resonating in the same frequency as the incoming waves. I've got that depicted here in a situation that actually it totally happens in real life if you are able, ever able to test this out. So I've got a ghetto blaster and what it's doing, let's say it's playing a tone. Maybe it's playing middle C, just a bing, you know, one, that's probably not middle C, but let's say it was. I'm not a great singer of middle C. Let's just say it's just constantly playing that one frequency that is the same as a middle C right on there on the piano. So no one's touching the piano, but we've got the sound out of the speakers just like directed towards the piano. So the, the middle C sound waves coming out of the out of the speakers. And what you know, this is what happens with physical resonance. It's this physical thing where piano strings on the piano will begin resonating with the incoming sound wave. So piano, um, they have 88 keys or whatever, and uh, all of these strings on the back, you can, it's kind of hard to see them. Um, and they're all of different lengths. And, and it, when you hit a key, a hammer hits the string and the string waves and that particular frequency of the string makes a sound, right? And the sounds are, uh, the strings are longer for the bass notes and they make a low sound. They get shorter for the high notes and they make a high sound. And in the middle, there's like a medium like string and it's tuned to middle C. Uh, what's really cool about physical resonance is that when some sound wave carrying that same frequency out in the world hits the piano, um, the string that is tuned to middle C will um, become attracted to this carrier wave and it will start vibrating a little bit. So that if you turned off the ghetto blaster, you'd actually be able to hear the piano uh, string middle C a little bit, even though you didn't touch it. Now, another thing that's happening is that um, middle C is not the only string that resonates, actually. Turns out that the strings, all the strings will resonate as a function of how similar they are to this incoming wave. So if you know about pianos and, and octave relationships in music, there's a middle C, but there's also C's uh, every octave going up and C's going down too. Uh, those other C's are higher and higher and higher and or lower, lower, lower. And they have similar wave properties and they will start resonating too, just not as loudly. Uh, relatedly, in terms of how these things work, there's a, a, a major fifth up from a C, which is a G. Th those notes will resonate a little bit too, but much more quietly. So the big idea is that a sound wave 
from an external device will cause lots of strings to move and make a sound just a little bit. And it will, um, if, the, if the string is in the same frequency, it will resonate loud. And if the string is in a nearby frequency, it'll, it'll resonate um, softer. And if it's in an unrelated frequency, it won't resonate very much. Okay. So these ideas are used in instance theory. And they're kind of generalized uh, to think about memory as a kind of uh, experiential resonance process. So I've changed the picture. Now what we have is, um, let's see, over here we've got a picture of a cat. So we could think about this as something that's happening right now in, in the present moment. Uh, maybe you're looking at a cat. It could be anything that's going on right now. It could be if you're looking at a, uh, I forgot what this is called. Oh, wow. <laughs> a measuring tape. That would be the stimulus in the present moment. Um, we're always uh, in the present moment, so there's always some stimulus pattern there that uh, is, in in this theory, it's it's projecting or it's impinging upon um, not a piano, but a, this is like a, the idea that you're, you've got a whole bunch of memory for prior experience. So over here, instead of a piano with a lot of strings, what we have is essentially a memory bank that's full of memory traces. Uh, so this is just a visual depiction of the idea that you've had like, I don't know, how many millions of individual experiences in your whole life, right? And I'm just trying to, it's trying to represent some, almost like, like all the pictures in your phone or something like that. We've got little slices of previous experiences you've had. And some of them might be really decayed, so there's not much patterns in them. Or some of them might have a lot of the original information that was in that experience, like maybe as you could kind of see, it's like, okay, you're outside in the trees somewhere, um, or maybe, I don't know what this is. These are all just different experiences. So the idea is that whatever pattern is in the present moment, that pattern is going to resonate with some traces in your memory. In particular, um, Memory, uh, uh, memory traces will get activated depending on how similar they are to what's out there in the environment. So it's hard to see, but what I've got here is a, a slice that has some cats in it. So it's pulled out a little bit just to kind of give you the idea that, well, that memory trace is probably wiggling a little bit in your head when you're looking at a cat. So if I'm looking at this cat, um, what's probably going on in my uh, bank of memory traces, according to this theory, is that my prior experience with my own cats are getting activated a little bit. Or even my prior experience with the last time I gave this lecture and looked at this slide is getting activated a little bit because uh, or probably what's not happening is there's a whole bunch of memories that aren't getting activated because they're not very similar to this, to this stimulus. So some memories get activated, some memories don't. Uh, lots of, or, uh, the extent to which a memory gets activated is depending on how similar it is to the pattern in the present moment. These are the big ideas. So we're going to uh, codify these verbally, these uh, assumptions to talk about instance theory. Uh, so the first basic assumption is that uh, people encode the details of individual experiences. And two, that retrieval is similarity driven. And this gets us to the idea I was just expressing that the pattern in the present moment, whatever it is, it retrieves experiences with similar patterns from the past. It's a pretty simple idea, really. Uh, we're going to see how far that idea can go today.
Another uh, couple of points I want to mention is that there are numerous instance theories out there. So different researchers uh, have slightly different versions of their uh, theory. Uh, they're broadly similar. And these kinds of theories, they, they range in what I'll call specificity. So some of these theories have been published only in verbal form, and some of them have been published in computational form. Uh, here's two really fantastic papers that talk about instance theory uh, in a verbal form. And, and so here we're just you know, laying out the principles and in much kind of like similar way that I'm talking about them. We won't talk about these papers too much. I'm just reminding us that the big idea here is we're going to be thinking about how memory works in terms of queued recall. And as we, and we're going to do that right now, we're going to jump into a more specific way of thinking about this in terms of a computational theory. Uh, and again, the goal here as we jump in, because this is going to get pretty specific, it's not to be able to uh, totally understand this theory. Uh, it's to be able to get some experience seeing what a computational theory looks like. Okay. We're talking about something called Minerva 2, and it's a, what's known as a global matching model of memory. It's, it was uh, put forward by Doug Hintzman in a series of papers, and uh, it allows us to express the ideas of instance theory as a computer algorithm, which makes it easier to evaluate what these ideas can actually do. Uh, it's also being applied across a whole bunch of different domains in cognition. So it's, it's quite impressive how many different phenomena it can potentially explain. I'll just give you a, a, a short list here. So it can potentially explain how people do frequency judgments. Uh, for example, how many times did I hold this up before? Was it only one time or two times or three times or four times? Uh, you probably were able to, to say that it was more than one time. So how, how were you able to do that? Um, it, <clears throat> according to this model, uh, you've got a whole bunch of individual memories for this lecture. And that means you've got some slices where I put this up here a bunch of times. And when I asked you this question, those memories get more activated than other memories from this lecture. And you're able to convert that memory activation into a judgment about frequency. This model is being applied to false memories. It's being applied to selective memory deficits and age-related memory decline. It is, after all, a model of memory. So it's being applied widely in the memory literature. What's interesting about the model, is it's also been applied outside of the memory literature. So it's been forward as a model of a prototype abstraction and as a model of artificial grammar learning and implicit sequence learning and judgments of likelihoods, uh, processes involved in eyewitness identification, and even some, some verbal and language stuff as lexical access, that is like bringing to mind of words, associative learning. Uh, so actually, I'm a, uh, an author on this paper here where uh, Randy Jameson, Sam Hanna, and I use this model of memory to exp uh, as a process explanation of classical conditioning phenomena. This model is also being applied as an account of semantic memory and even um, processes involved in sentence production. That's how you put words together in correct order. So that's a whole bunch of things. That makes the model quite interesting. And uh, the very similar assumptions have been put forward across all of those different uh, versions of the model. Okay. So we're nearly done this portion of the lecture. And I think we've got, yeah, just two more slides. 
And what we're about to do is jump into the model a little bit to get a feeling for what it is and how it works. This is a picture of the model that we'll be uh, reproducing in Excel in the next mini lecture. But I'll, I'll li uh, leave this lecture with uh, just a brief discussion of what's going on here. So up at the top, we've got something called a feature vector. This is intended to represent a pattern in the present moment. So you could think about this like the cat picture, you know, like what's going on right now? There's a pattern going on right now. And that is a cue to your memory, whatever's happening right now. So in the model, uh, we, the model recognizes that any given situation is probably pretty complicated and it, it's got a lot of features in it. It doesn't say what a feature is. It just says that, yeah, I mean, this situation, for example, like just take a look at this little box where my face is. We've, we've got some features in here. We've got a face, a black shirt. We've got a painting in the background. We've got, I don't know, that's what, a, a light switch. We've got a beige wall. That's what's going on here. And, um, you know, the features change. So now the, there's now there's a tape measure. Now there's some headphones, you know. Some, some situations have some features and other situations have other features. Those features are represented here by the, pre or let's say the presence or absence of features in a stimulus is represented by a vector. And this is uh, a series of numbers. So we've got a negative one, a plus one, a negative one. These dots are just representing this vector could be very long. It could just go on and on and on. Uh, negative one, what that means is whatever this square represents, some feature. Let's say it means like, is a tape measure there? Negative one means no, it's not there. But this is another feature. A plus one means whatever that feature is, it's there. So let's say this feature is coding for having a painting in the background. Uh, plus one, it's there. We'll talk a little bit more about feature vectors later on, but the Big idea is just, it's a way to represent the presence or absence of features. And um, one whole feature vector, it means it represents all of the features that were there or not there uh, in a particular slice of experience. The next part here is we have this uh, place for memory traces. So there's this idea that, well, you've been around and you've had all these experiences and um, each of your experiences has a bunch of features and you've got a whole bunch of them in memory. So this is uh, one of your previous memories here. This is another previous memory. And it just goes on and on and on and on where you've got a bunch of these memory traces. And what do memory traces have? Well, they're, they're, um, they're a representation of the features that were in that experience. And uh, so we've got, yeah, that feature was in this experience. This feature wasn't. Uh, we've got a zero here. This is the idea that, you know, mem memory representations might be imperfect. So you might lose information. So a zero would be, you don't know if that feature was there or not because you kind of lost the information. Um, all right, so, so far we've got a, some stuff that reminds us of the, the cat and all those memory traces, right? This is the cat. These are all the memory traces. Now, the idea is that all of this is a, is a system of cued recall. So that is, if I'm looking at whatever this pattern is in the current environment, what, it, what is happening is, um, some of the memory traces that are, or some memory traces are getting activated because of their similarity to this one. Uh, so the model assumes that uh, a, some similarity, pro, a similarity calculation is made between the current pattern and every pattern in memory. And that's what these A's are. These are uh, referring to how activated the memories are. 
So this, this memory might be really activated if it's really similar, and this memory might not be very activated because it isn't very, very similar. But, but every memory in your whole memory system will be activated or not, depending on how similar it is to the present experience. So the, the next assumption in this model Yeah, this next assumption is a lot like the piano metaphor from before. So if we jump back to that piano metaphor, whoops, uh, just talk about, um, so this is the memory probe. It's acting as a cue. It's causing all, uh, all the memories to be activated a little bit. So some memories that are really similar they're going to be really, really activated. Some other memories that are a little bit less similar, they'll also be quite activated. The really dissimilar memories won't be that activated. And just like on this piano, some strings will be resonating more than others. And, and the point is to think about what's coming back from memory. So if, if the piano strings represent the activation of all of your memory traces, what is the... Um, memory system bringing back to you uh, and uh, in a in the piano context we're not hearing just one string but we're hearing all of the strings as a chorus there and we are kind of hearing the the total pattern of the resonating piano And that idea is reflected in the model by this concept of a memory echo. So just like the piano pushes out a, a sound of all of its strings resonating, the memory is going to push out a total memory response. And uh, in this model, that is the, the sum of the similarity weighted traces. We'll see that in Excel a little bit more clearly, but the idea is like some of these traces will be really active uh, and some of them won't be very active. If we added them all together, the ones that weren't very active, they wouldn't really, you wouldn't be able to really, really hear them. The ones that are really active uh, they would be much louder. When you add them all together, you get a kind of blend of all of the memories that were the most active. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, that is in the model what memory is, uh, what, I what is the experience of kind of um, having a memory. So when I put this tape measure back up here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not specifically having a single memory of previous times I used that tape measure or previous things I remember about it. Uh, I'm able to access maybe some single memories, but I'm also having like a global uh, aggregate memory, which, which is all of the prior experiences that somehow are similar to this cue. All right, nearly done. So we're gonna, I'm gonna stop this mini, mini lecture and then I'm gonna open up a Microsoft Excel document and we're gonna look at uh, how this model works in a little bit more detail to see the step-by-step -step that we would take. And then we're gonna apply it to a few different cognitive phenomena to see you know how this thing actually is used to explain particular abilities so that's it for now we'll see you on the other side <laughs>